My name is Andre, and this incident took place five weeks ago. I have a co-worker named Mike. He is a very jealous person that thinks he's better than the rest of us, even though he does no work whatsoever. He doesn't like it when we talk to him, but expects us to be interested in what he likes to say. Now to the story. I work for a company that requires me to get up at 2 in the morning and prepare to leave at 5 in the morning, so waking up is not something I'm a fan of. But I get a steady paycheck, so it's okay. Mike does not get a paycheck like everybody else's, though. He gets 5% lower because he does not do any work, so he takes his rage upon us. Like one day I was at the movies, and suddenly he came up to me and punched me, despite the fact that I was in the front row, so everyone could see. Another time I was at the bar playing darts, and suddenly he came, grabbed a dart pin, and proceeded to try and stab me with it. I dodged it, and all the men in the bar assisted me with throwing him out. Just about 12 to 15 weeks ago, my girlfriend and I were about to kiss, when he came to my window and took a picture with an old Polaroid. And as he shook the photo, I punched him and drove his incapacitated body back to his little home. But by far, this incident was the worst of them all. It happened when I was at home sleeping, when I suddenly woke up to the sound of banging at my front door. Wake up, Andre! I heard outside. I knew that voice. It was Mike at my door. I heard what I thought sounded like a motorcycle at my front door. But instead, I saw it was a chainsaw. Now I see you die, Mike said from the other side. I bolted to get my airsoft rifle and just in time. When he burst in, I shot him. First in the leg, then in the eye. Then I ran to call the cops, but Mike was still on his two legs. So then he cut a chunk of the flesh off my left arm. I screamed but still managed to turn around and shoot him in his private area twice. He fell to the ground, and I was able to call the cops. Mike was arrested, and I immediately booked a flight to a different state. After the flight, I received a call from the police telling me that Mike killed another co-worker before he came to kill me, and that he planned to kill many more than just two. Every morning, I look outside and thank God I survived that because I don't know what would have happened if I had not woken up that night. There was a murder in my apartment building. The deceased was a middle-aged man who lived in the penthouse. The killer had cut his mouth from ear to ear with a knife and nailed the corners of his mouth up to his temples. The man was found dead with his eyes rolled back and a grotesque grin on his face. The residents of the apartment lived in fear and the investigation was slow as the murderer scene yielded no evidence of the killer. Three days after the incident, the same video was sent simultaneously to the cell phones of all the residents of the apartment building from a mysterious number. The video showed a clown looking at the screen and giggling in an unnerving manner, saying, Smile, smile, smile. He then picked up the camera and showed us his surroundings the penthouse of the man who died a few days earlier. The man was tied to a chair, crying out for help, and the clown pulled out a sharp knife and began to slice the man's mouth open. After slicing the screaming, struggling man's mouth from ear to ear, the clown held the corner of the man's mouth up, smiled for the camera, and then took out a hammer and began hammering nails into the corner of the mouth. The clown giggled, as he spun around in the swiveled chair to which the man was strapped with his mouth torn open and a wide grin on his face. Then the screen suddenly went black and the words James Room 503 Next appeared in white letters on a dark background. My heart sank and I sat back in my seat. The fact that the clown knew my name and my home address gave me goosebumps. How did he know me and why was I his next target? I hadn't done anything to earn someone's grudge. While I sat there in a panic, other residents who had seen the video called the police and officers came to my house. They asked me if I knew who the clown was, and I suddenly realized that the man next door in room 504 might be the culprit. 
I had been losing sleep over the past few nights due to a thumping noise coming from my neighbor. One night, I went to bed before an important meeting the next day, and again I heard a thumping noise from my neighbors. So I went over to their house after midnight and rang the doorbell. Who is it? The suspicious-looking man next door opened the front door with a hanger, and through the narrow doorway I could see he was holding a hammer. I don't know what he was doing in the middle of the night, but that hammer seemed to be the source of the noise. It's your neighbor. You're being too loud and I need to get some sleep, I said in an irritated tone to the man, who glared at me for a moment before slamming the front door. I told the police that I heard the man next door hammering every night and had seen him with a hammer myself, so I suspected he was the culprit. The police listened to my story and they said they would take a closer look at the man next door. When the police returned, I couldn't bear to stay in the apartment, so I took an extended leave of absence from work, packed up my things, and went down to the countryside to live with my parents. I stayed at my parents' house for about a month, and there were no more murders in the apartment because the police were keeping an eye on the man next door. With this lull, I returned to the apartment on my last day of vacation. I walked into the lobby of my apartment building and was greeted by the doorman with a big smile on his face. You're back home. I'm so glad you're safe. Yes, it's been a while. After a long drive, I was too tired to answer the man's friendly greeting. So I gave a rough answer and I waited for the elevator. He told me that he saw the man next door lurking in front of my door a few days ago and that he's going to take me there because he thinks it might be dangerous. When we got to the fifth floor and the elevator doors opened, I saw my neighbor standing in front of my front door smoking a cigarette. The man's eyes looked murderous, and I was terrified. So I asked the doorman to go inside the house with me. He and I walked past the neighbor in a tense moment, and suddenly the neighbor lunged at me from behind, grabbed me from the back of the head, and started dragging me into his house. Help me! I shouted, frightened. The doorman quickly picked up my suitcase and slammed it down on the man's head as hard as he could and the man collapsed, bleeding on the spot. What do we do now? I think he's dead. I asked him, breathing heavily. He looked surprised and broke out in a cold sweat. I didn't think he would die. Isn't this considered self-defense? Let's get him inside the house before anyone sees him and think about it. He and I picked up the fallen man and hurried him inside the house. I don't think anyone else has seen him yet, he said, looking out the front door. Just then, the man next door, whom I thought was dead, struggled to raise his head and shouted, Run! Suddenly, the doorman pulled out a knife from his pocket and slashed the man's mouth wide with a single blow, and the man screamed and died with one side of his mouth torn off. When I saw the scene, I was so stunned that my whole body went rigid. The doorman said, Whew! That could have been really bad! He breathed a sigh of relief and took off his jumper, revealing a colorful clown costume hidden inside. He smiled up at me, put on the clown mask, and said, Hello, James, from room 503. You didn't smile when I smiled and greeted you in the lobby every day. The people who live here are so unkind. Anyone who doesn't respond back to my smile will keep smiling even after they die. (laughs) My name is Kenny, but this isn't a personal story of mine, but I was able to witness my friend's reaction the moment after, so I guess I'll start now. I was in the seventh grade, and I was with some friends. Let's call them Abigail, Daniela, Angeline, Sherilyn, and Aline. To give a little background, our room was kind of worn out. Wooden windows that were missing parts, The paint on the walls was chipping, and the lizards roamed the ceiling illuminated by three light bulbs. Our room was always messy because my classmates at the time were disrespectful. I could say I hated that group of classmates. Basically, there weren't any teachers that would check on us. I don't know, but we expected our next subject teacher to come in. But unfortunately, no one came into our room. So people are going about their business, but the naughty classmates just started going crazy bullying and teasing innocent classmates of mine. Others are using their cell phones and turning on their flashlights because it was a rainy day, which was pretty frequent. 
I was just on my chair beside my friend Abigail when all of a sudden, the thunderstorm rumbled the ground and cut off the electricity. But we continued talking and laughing. I didn't have a cell phone at the time, so I was bored. But my classmates did, and I was super jealous of them. Not long after, Aline and Daniela began crying and sobbing and I didn't know why. My friends and other classmates came to our spot and asked them what was wrong. Daniela's face was trembling and Aline was still sobbing. Daniela said that when her and Aline were minding their own business, you know, styling their hair like teen girls, to be specific, they were sitting on the floor behind my chair when the two of them looked down and saw a girl underneath me. She kept staring at them with her head tilted down. The scary part is, the girl's eyes were completely red, which is why they screamed. Me being confused, looked below my chair to see if there was ghosts or anything scary. I was so scared, but my gut told me I should try. So I did. I slowly looked down, and to my surprise, it was normal, like usual. Nothing was there. So I looked up at my friends, and they were still crying. The next morning, my friend Abigail told me a story of hers, too. Our teacher always assigns a classmate to hold the keys for the classroom to open early, and she was the one who was assigned the key that day. Abigail arrived early and was about to go through the door when she peeked in the window and saw a girl in our room. The girl was sitting in the cabinet near the blackboard. Abigail admitted it's a ghost. There's really a ghost in her school. After hearing that, I got goosebumps all over. I don't know what was going on then, but some say our school was a cemetery before a school was built on top. But yeah, this may not be a personal story of mine, but I experienced this story over and over again, as if I was the one who saw her. This is an eerie experience I had when I was in my early 20s, about 10 years ago. At that time, I was looking for a place to live independently, and I found a very cheap place and signed the contract right away. However, on the first day I entered the house, I saw a note on the front door that said, No one has stayed in this house for more than a month. Good luck. I thought it was just a funny prank by someone, so I started living in the house, and a few days later, I saw something through my bedroom window to the neighboring house's window. It was the silhouette of a person shaking back and forth. When I looked closer, a woman was hanging from several ropes attached to the ceiling, suspended in the air, staring at me in a relaxed posture. Although I felt a bit eerie, I just thought, there's a strange person living next door. I looked away and didn't pay much attention. However, after a while, I looked at the window again out of curiosity and she was still there, smiling slightly and staring at me intently. I closed the curtains and felt strange afterwards. From then on, I didn't open the curtains for a few days because I felt like she would still be there, suspended in the air and staring at me. One day, I heard a knock on the front door. I opened it without much thought and she was standing there. I was surprised and she asked me, Why don't you open the curtains? I was taken back, but pretended to be nonchalant and replied, I just don't usually look outside my window. Then she started singing. You have to open the curtains so you can see me. Open the curtains. I felt chills down my spine and quickly closed the door. I hesitated. Should I call the police? But I didn't want to complicate things. I just left the curtains open because I feared that she would return to my house. Then she appeared again, hanging on the ropes with a pleased expression. She swayed back and forth while staring at me intensely. I stared at her for a while, feeling dazed, and then I quickly closed the curtains and drank some cold water. Somehow, I started to feel strange then. She was definitely an odd person, but I felt a strange attraction towards her although I didn't know why. The next day, I opened the curtains again, but she was no longer there. Only the ropes were hanging there. I waited for her all day, but she didn't appear, and she didn't show up for a few days. I eventually went to her house and knocked on her door. She opened the door and invited me in. 
Her house was filled with countless ropes hanging from the ceiling, which was a bit eerie, but I didn't think much of it. She was very skilled at maneuvering the ropes, gliding around the house like she was flying. Then she said to me, You should try it too, it's really fun. The ropes were hanging very high, which made me a bit scared, but I decided to follow her and climbed onto the ropes. But at that moment, I lost my balance and fell backwards, screaming in pain as I hit the ground. Something was off though. She just looked down at me with a cheerful expression, not helping me or showing any concern. It was as if she was simply watching me. It sent shivers down my spine and I quickly left her house, returning home. I closed the curtains and never opened them again. A few days later, she came to my house and knocked on the door. I didn't open it, but she continued to sing outside endlessly. I thought she was a psychopath and decided to move. After some time, I moved out and had normal days afterward. However, I heard on the news about a man who moved into that house. Shortly after he moved in, he fell from a rope at the house of the woman next door and died of a concussion. The police ruled it as an accidental death and the woman was cleared of all charges, but I couldn't help but wonder if he fell on his own, or was it something that she had planned? Only she knows the truth. After that day, I never heard any news about that house or the woman again. Time has passed, but I still wonder, is she still riding ropes there, and is someone still hanging on the ropes she made? It was a cold night on December 17th, 2021. My cousins and I were playing video games on my PlayStation 4 in the living room. We ate snacks like Pringles and nuts and drank pear soda. About an hour later, it was 3 a.m. and I fell asleep. I woke up to pitch black darkness and dead silence. The only thing I could hear were cicada bugs, loud as shit. I then got the urge for a cold drink so I went over to the fridge and got my soda. I turned around and my blood ran cold. Right in front of me were two green glowing eyes. I threw my drink at the two eyes and they darted across the kitchen and through the open window. Then I could see it running down the street outside. It was wearing ripped and shredded newspaper. Also, this could not have been a human because as most should know, Human eyes don't glow in pitch darkness unless you're taking a picture, and my phone had been in the other room. I was in shock at what happened, and also surprisingly, my cousins did not wake up from it, nor did my mom. All of a sudden, I felt sick and fell down. I woke up to bright light that morning and was on my couch. This is where it gets very chilling and mysterious. My cousin came to tell me she had a dream of me getting a soda and locking eyes with a green-eyed humanoid, just like the one I described earlier. I told her that the same incident happened to me last night, but I fainted and then woke up. Did I enter my cousin's dream? Or worse yet, did my cousin dream about my terrifying reality? I'll leave you to decide. This story happened to me in 2019. I came home from school really tired and I was feeling sick and dizzy. I told my mom about it and told her I would rest for a bit. I laid down and took a nap. A few hours passed. I woke up feeling thirsty. I also noticed that I was feeling better already. I got up and got my glass of water. I came back to my room shook up and frightened. What I saw was myself sleeping on my bed. I thought I was dreaming, so I tried to pinch myself. I didn't feel anything. Was I dreaming? Was this real? One idea popped into my head. What if I laid down in the same exact position as my body? Will I come back? I did exactly what I thought was the best idea. 
I positioned myself and closed my eyes. Right then and there, I woke up. I saw my mother holding my hand, crying. She hugged me really tight and said, You were so pale and cold. I thought something had happened to you. I was just going to give you some food because you haven't eaten. I'm here to tell the story of the time I went to the park with my friends. On a Friday night during the summer, I asked my friends Alyssa and Maya to come over to play Just Dance and have a sleepover. Alyssa arrived first, then Maya. We go upstairs to put the sleepover stuff in my room and head back downstairs to my living room to play Just Dance like we normally do on Fridays. We played for hours, and of course, I got mega stars every time. My friend Maya suggested we go to the playground right next door to my house to stargaze. We tell my dad where we're going and head to the park in our little fuzzy PJ pants and sweatshirts. I often get paranoid, and my biggest fear is what's lurking in the dark. My friends know that, so they comfort me in those situations. We start walking to the playground, and I'm already pretty anxious. We make it to the swing set, and we start acting like idiots, laughing like little kids telling their moms to push them. Then we stop laughing as much and start spilling secrets. I start having this feeling that we're being watched, but I looked around, and there were no cars in the parking lot, and no one at the field, at the playground, or bathroom. I thought to myself, what if it's just an animal? But then I think, no, we are being watched. I know it. My instincts are right almost every time. My friend noticed me getting scared, so Alyssa says an inside joke of ours and starts reminiscing about old times. I start to feel better and decide to play some music and run up the slide to lighten the mood. My friends take some pictures of me holding up a peace sign on the swings for their snap stories. I run down to join them as Maya pushes Alyssa on the swings, and I begin checking my phone to see the pictures of me. In the corner of my eye, I see something moving. That's when I stand up from my swing and see the shadow underneath the slide. I go over to my friends and say, Yo guys, do you guys see that thing too? They both say, No, it's probably a shadow from a car passing or something. Relax. I knew in my mind that I'm not going crazy, and then I say, No guys, really, there's someone under the slide, look! Then Alyssa sees the thing move towards the slide, and she yells, Yeah, you're right, there's definitely someone under the slides. The thing starts inching towards us on all fours, moving like a lengthy animal. It was so creepy, I've never seen anything move like that in my life. It was so long and moving so silently. I grabbed our phones that were on the ground and sprinted for my house like I was in the Olympics. I yell, start running now! My friends stayed at the swings. I looked back and yell, why are you guys sitting there? Run! My friends then started running slowly and then looked at me and said, Haley, you're going way too fast. Slow down. I tell them, guys, he might be following us. You gotta catch up. We make it to my house and slam the door shut. Then we run to my dad and tell him what we saw. Alyssa says while her and Maya were still at the swing, she saw it was a man with a tilted head and a sad emotion on his face. He looked young, like in his 30s, but obviously not some little kid who needed to find their parents, or they would have come up to us and asked for help. My dad said it was probably some prankster and to not overthink it. We went up to my room and my friends kept telling me it was probably no big deal. I kept thinking of all the possibilities of creeps stalking us at night. It's been months since then, and my friends have recently told me how they still don't know the mystery behind the man at the park. To this day, I don't go to the park at night. For your own safety, I suggest you don't either, no matter how fun it may sound. Or you might end up in my situation, but not as lucky. I actually had a personal experience happen to me when I was nine. I thought you would be interested in it, so here it is. This happened to me when I went to my home country with my mom for vacation to meet my relatives and my dad was still working at the time. We were in the city where my oldest cousin's brother, who was 11 at the time, and his parents lived. We all were coming back from another relative's house at around 2.30 or 3 a.m. While we were going back to our house in my cousin's car, that's when a guy, probably in his 30s, came running to our car and my uncle, cousin's dad, stopped the car and the guy started knocking on the window so my uncle rolled down the window and asked what's wrong to which the guy replied panting saying he needed a ride and my uncle was about to say yes when my mom said in our language so that he wouldn't understand that there are kids in the car don't take the risk 
then my uncle apologized and said it was too late and we were in a hurry as well, but he kept begging, so my uncle had to drive past him. And while we were leaving, that's when my cousin and I saw from the back windows five men with weapons in their hands and the guy talking to them, looking at us and pointing towards us and started following us. But after a while, they stopped. It was one of the scariest moments of my life. Thank God we reached home safely, but I couldn't stop thinking that what if my uncle had agreed and my mom hadn't stopped him? And what if we get stopped even for a single moment when they followed us? Would I have lived to tell this story? I'm currently 36, but this happened when I was 18. I was a high school graduate. I was working at a job. Not a big job, but a minor job. I obviously didn't want to work at McDonald's. The only job that was less crappy was at Costco. So I decided to go work there. I was interviewed by the manager, and before I knew it, I got the job. My position was a cashier. My first two weeks were great, but that was when I met James. James was 63 years old. He said he'd served his time in the military and was in the Korean War. He seemed like a nice guy at first, until he started to smell like garbage most days. When the store reached its 10-year anniversary, we all went to James's house. The moment we entered James's house, it smelled like shit. When it was time to eat, James came out with what looked like tomato soup, judging by the color. But when we ate it, it tasted funny. After the party, while I was driving home, I felt like I was going to sleep. I don't remember much, but the next morning I woke up in a hospital bed. My mom was crying and my dad shook his head and was nodding side to side. Then a doctor came into my room saying that I crashed into a pole. I suffered a broken arm. Then I remembered James's soup. I told the doctor to call the cops. When they arrived, I gave them my statement. To my knowledge, they went to James's house and found him eating the arm of a human. He was arrested on the spot. As it turns out, he was a serious murderer. He was sentenced to life in prison. To this day, I think back to when I considered him a co-worker. This happened to me a few years ago. It was late at night and I was on a road trip to Alabama for my great uncle's birthday. It was pretty far from where I lived, almost eight hours. I went to make a stop to refill my car. It was at a shady gas station. I had this feeling of discomfort as I got out of the car. I filled the car up, then went inside to pay. When I got inside, I saw they had snacks, so I took two bags of chips and an energy drink. I gave the snacks to the cashier and also paid for the gas. As I stepped out, I saw another car. It was black and the windows were tinted so I couldn't see who was inside. The car was positioned sideways in a parking spot. I ignored it and got in my car and drove. I was driving in the countryside so there were no street lights. After five minutes, I looked in my mirror and I noticed the black car following me. I ignored the car and kept on driving. Then the man came in front of me and started swerving. I quickly passed him and stepped on the gas. I wanted to get out of the area quickly, so I went faster and faster. I suddenly lost control of the car and went into a ditch. I tried calling the towing service, but there was no signal. I got out of the car to go find help and saw the black car. This time, the driver got out of the car, and when I looked at him, I froze in fear. He had long brown hair down to his waist and had a deformed jaw as if someone punched him. He had scratches all over his face and arms, and he had a psycho grin on his face. He lunged toward me and bit my arm. I tried pinching him with my fingernails, but he wouldn't let go. He pulled out a knife and tried to stab me. I thought, this is it. Then I heard sirens. The man put the knife back in his pocket and gave me his psycho grin as he ran into the forest. I waved down the police and told them everything. The officer who went into the woods caught him and put him inside the car. 
Apparently, the man escaped from a mental asylum a week and a half ago and stole a car from one of the nurses. The cops helped me call a towing service, and then when I was back in the city, I rented a car to go to my great uncle's birthday. All I was thinking about was the man. If the cops had gotten there a few minutes later, I would have been on the news. My name is Michael, and I'm a prison guard at this penitentiary. As I was doing my rounds today, inmate number 1857, hanging on his cell bars, shouted at me. Hey, your daughter's seven years old this year, right? She's the first one I'll visit when I get out. What? Enraged, I rushed to the bars and grabbed his collar, and he laughed as if it were amusing. Inmate 1857. His name is Rick, the most notorious criminal in this prison. Rick is a psychopath who killed a woman in her 60s, chopped her up with a knife, and even ate her flesh before claiming insanity. Rick was incredibly lucky. The victim's son actively sought leniency for him. The devout Christian son decided to forgive Rick in the name of God, even after his mother was brutally murdered. It was something I couldn't understand at all. Thanks to this, Rick was acknowledged as mentally impaired and received a 15-year sentence only. After his sentence was confirmed, Rick began to show his true colors. He constantly hurled insults without reason and threatened to kill the families of those who irritated him once he was released. Knowing his madness, people grew anxious as his release date approached. The ironic thing was that this psychopath was a dutiful son. Having lived with his single mother his entire life, he cherished her dearly. His mother began preparing to open a beef jerky store with Rick about a month before his release and started sending boxes of jerky and letters to the prison. However, bringing in outside food was strictly forbidden in the prison. So we tried to return the parcels she sent, but the warden stopped me and said he would allow the packages to be delivered to Rick. I couldn't understand his actions. The warden must have been bribed by Rick's mother. Dear son, your mother is preparing a jerky business these days. Please try it and give me your feedback. From your future business partner, Mom. When I opened the box of jerky, I saw a letter written in meticulous handwriting. She seemed quite serious about the business, sending a box of jerky made with various recipes to the prison every week. Smoked, chili, teriyaki flavors, and more. And thanks to this, Rick spent his days chewing on jerky. He even began using the jerky like currency, ordering his cellmates around. The prisoners, who relied solely on the prison-provided rations, cleaned for Rick, acted violently on his behalf, or dug up information on people Rick didn't like in exchange for jerky. Rick also collected feedback from the inmates about which jerky recipe tasted the best and sent letters to his mother. He was already fulfilling his role as a business partner before his release. He showed no remorse for the deceased victim and focused solely on making the business prosper. I was angry at the victim's son. If my mother had been so brutally murdered, I would have never forgiven the perpetrator. Due to his excessive tolerance, the evil demon would soon be released into the world and more victims would follow, which could include my own family. Rick's release date approached, now just a week away and his mother had already opened the store and was waiting for him. The store was named Mom's Beef Jerky as a tribute to her love for her son. As the release date neared and my anxiety peaked, I took a secret day off, which I didn't tell my wife and daughter about. I had to visit Rick's store, track his movements, and carefully devise ways to protect my family from him. When I went to the address written on the letter, mom's beef jerky. I noticed a sign with a familiar phrase. It was a store opened by Rick's mother. At that time, I saw the warden coming out of the store. It was clear that he was involved in some sort of backroom dealing with Rick's mother. I hid in my car until the warden disappeared, then entered the store. Now that I had witnessed it with my own eyes, I had to expose their inappropriate dealings. As I opened the store door, there stood a man there with fair skin and a gentle demeanor. Welcome. Huh? 
Isn't this Rick's mother's store? Oh, yes, it is. Who are you? You should be the employee. I'm a prison guard at the prison where your son is incarcerated. I saw the warden leaving just now. What's the relationship between him and Rick's mother? Oh, Rick's mother is inside. Would you like to meet her and hear it directly from her? Follow me. I followed the man to a storeroom deep inside the kitchen, and he pointed to the ceiling, saying, She's here. There, a middle-aged woman's head was hanging from the ceiling, shriveled and twisted after being soaked in sauce. Ah! What is this? I was so shocked that I screamed and collapsed on the spot. Then the man smiled brightly and said, I'm the son of the woman who was killed by Rick. I've been waiting for Rick to be released and come to this store as soon as possible. Whew! I've sent the rest of the body, and now only the head remains. I'll prepare the head according to the final recipe Rick advised, and plan to send it to the prison tomorrow. I ran out of there in utter disbelief, and didn't tell anyone about what happened that day. A week later, I saw the corner of the prison warden's mouth go up strangely as he stared at Rick, who was happily tasting the last delivered jerky. And not long after his release, Rick went missing. My name is Jelly, and I have a stalking story. When I was in high school, there was a lot of boys in my school who courted me, but I rejected all of them because they didn't pass my vibe. Then there was this guy named John. He studied at the other school, not my school, and he courted me. At first, I wondered how he knew me. Then I found out that his cousin Carlo was my classmate when I was in elementary school. So basically, his cousin Carlo was the bridge between me and John. Everything seemed fine. John's nice, so... I thought I should answer him. Then days passed, and John stopped messaging me. I thought maybe he was busy. And then months passed. I still got no response from John. And his cousin Carlo was the one who kept messaging me all the time. At first, it was just a friendly conversation, but day by day, the conversation started to level up to the point where he asked me if he can court me. So I was shocked, because he's the one who forced his cousin John to me, and now he wants to court me? Then I saw on Facebook that John posted a picture of him and a girl. I was brokenhearted because I already loved him. When I was brokenhearted, John's cousin Carlo comforted me. I am really open to my mom, so I told her that this guy named Carlo was courting me. My mom told me if he's nice and if he loves me, then why don't you give it a try? What I didn't know is that Carlo was texting my mom about me. Days passed. My mom kept forcing me to Carlo, but... I didn't like him. My mom even got angry with me because I didn't want Carlo to be my boyfriend. I was so angry and sad at the same time because my mom was taking his side instead of me, her daughter. I asked my mom why she liked Carlo so much. It's her first time forcing someone for me. My mom said because Carlo was my classmate in elementary school and he's smart. It's true, Carlo is a genius. That's why he always wears glasses, but he is really weird. Every night I end up crying because my mom always asks me when I will answer Carlo. To avoid the situation, I started to date someone without telling my mom. Wherever I went, I felt like someone was stalking me. When I got home from school, I saw my mom sitting on the couch with an angry expression on her face. She asked me, you're dating someone? I was shocked. How did she know that? I denied it and she said if she caught me dating someone who's not Carlo, she'll move me to another school. I cried and ran to my room. I didn't understand why my mom wanted Carlo to be my boyfriend. She knew I didn't like him. We decided to move to another boarding house near my school because my younger brother is now in high school, which means he was now in my school. I woke up early because we had an exam. When I got out from the boarding house, I saw someone standing across the road staring at me. Then I realized it was Carlo. I hurriedly walked to school because I didn't want to interact with him. One day, my friends and I planned to hang out at night with our boyfriends. I knew my mom wouldn't let me, so I lied. I told her that only me and my friends Vicky and Carrie would be there, and she believed it, so she let me. I got home that night at 10 p.m. I saw my mom sitting on the couch with an angry expression on her face. I was curious because I asked for her permission first before I went to hang out, and she stood up and yelled, you went on a date, huh? I was shocked because how did she know? 
I denied it, but she said that someone saw me and my friends with our boyfriends on the Esplanade. Esplanade is a jogging area. She grounded me for a week. She stormed out of the living room and headed to her room. I saw her phone on the coffee table and I saw someone texted her, so I grabbed her phone and opened it since there's no lock. When I saw the person who texted her, I got so angry. It was Carlo. So that means he was stalking me and reported everything I was doing to my mom. Every morning I always saw him standing across the road from my boarding house, covering his mouth with a handkerchief. Every time I saw him, I felt like I wanted to cry. I was so scared and I didn't know what to do. Only my friends understood me. They told me to stay away from him. We had an upcoming program at school that was being held at the public soccer field. We were practicing our dance and I was really focused because I loved dancing. Then I saw Carlo in the waiting shed staring at me while covering his mouth with a handkerchief. I don't know why he covered his mouth with a handkerchief. I felt really uncomfortable. During our school program, I saw him in the waiting shed staring at me, but I just ignored him. After graduating high school, my mom suggested to move me to another school for a better education. It was my first day in university, and I was feeling excited and nervous at the same time. On the first day of school, I already made friends, because, you know, I'm kind of friendly. It was fun introducing ourselves and meeting new people. After our teacher dismissed the class, I was about to go out of the classroom when my heart sank. I saw Carlo walking in the hallway. He saw me, but I turned my back to him and waited for my friend to finish packing her modules in her bag. Before I walked out of the classroom, I checked my right side and my left side to see if he was there. There was no sign of him, so I grabbed my friend's arm and hurriedly walked to the school's gate. We said goodbye to each other, and I hurriedly ran to ride the jeepney. While I was inside of the jeepney, I felt like I wanted to scream. How did he know that I moved schools? Did my mom tell him? I felt like I was going crazy. Now he was in the same school with me, and he was going to stalk me every chance he gets. When I got home, I told my mom that I saw Carlo in school. I blamed everything on my mom. My mom said she lost contact with Carlo. She said she would never tell Carlo about my new school, but I didn't listen to her. I kept yelling at her. We argued for a while and I'd had enough, so I ran to my room and cried. I saw Carlo every day in school and kept ignoring him. It became too much and I was so done with him and I couldn't live like that. So what I did is I made more friends because I'm friendly and they can accompany me wherever I went. Like I asked them to go with me to the restroom. I surrounded myself with friends to forget him. And you know what? It actually worked. He's now scared to come near me because I have a lot of friends that surround me, and my friends are all well-known students in school because of their talents. They've asked me to join this and that activity, and of course I've agreed. And now that I know a lot of people in my school, and a lot of people know me, I am not afraid to be alone anymore. And Carlo, he distances himself from me now. Hello, I'm Rachel, but please call me Rach. I just found out today that my uncle is in fact a well-known murderer. I'm also the youngest niece. I give you full permission to take a video about this. I knew my uncle was a bit off when I was little, and if I asked my mother or another family member on my father's side, then they'd just say, Ted did some really bad things before you were born, so you're not allowed to be alone with him. That all changed when I turned 13 on April 7th. A while after I turned 13, I suddenly brought up the topic of Ted and my mother was a bit more comfortable to tell me that he indeed killed two people. He killed a man and a nurse. I was surprised my mother went into more detail, but I could tell she still wasn't comfortable going into full detail of what Ted did. And honestly, I couldn't blame her for it. She even told me that after her and my father got divorced due to him cheating on her and not being a good father, that my father, his name is James, told Ted to stalk me and my older sister, and my mother, and he did. The neighbors caught Ted watching us in their backyard and police were called. One time, he even left a death threat on my mother's vehicle after not getting him some Chick-fil-A or McDonald's or something like that. After Ted moved out, my mother changed all the locks on the old house and refused to let him in. She even said me and my sis were not allowed to be alone with Ted in my mother and father's divorce papers. Then today, on September 19th of 2021, my mother was finally comfortable enough to tell me everything. Ted Mayer, my uncle, has killed a very rich and well-known nurse in a fire along with another nurse. He was trying to be the hero, but he ended up killing them instead. My mother told me that he planned all this out for a few years, and then in 1999, he carried out the plan. 
It even says this in an article about Ted Mayer. It goes like this. Theodore Ted Mayer is an ex-Green Beret turned registered nurse who was convicted of arson in a 1999 fire that killed Edmund Safra and another nurse, Vivian Tarrant, at Safra's Monaco penthouse apartment. In October 2007, Mayer was released after serving eight years in jail. There was also an article about one of his victims that said this. Edmund J. Safra was a Lebanese-Brazilian banker who continued the family tradition of banking in Brazil and Switzerland. He was married to Lily Watkins from 1976 until his death. He died in a fire that attracted wide media interest and was judicially determined to be due to arson. After I looked up who is Ted Mayer, then I learned about what he really did. It explains a lot of why he gave off an extremely odd feeling, why he wasn't allowed to be unsupervised or left alone around children, and why he's no longer allowed to come to family gatherings. The reason why I want to share this post is to warn people about my uncle, who is known as Ted, or as Ted Mayer, to many. Please stay away from this man. Don't make eye contact with him, and don't ever welcome this man into your life. He's very dangerous and is willing to commit another crime like the one he committed in France. I can only just imagine what he would do to me if I was alone with him and no one was around, and I'm just thankful my mother had me and my older sisters back. <laughs> This is an experience I had when I was 16 years old during the winter. Since the incident, I still can't go outside on snowy days. Back then, whenever it snowed, there was something I always did. It was called snowman smashing. Paul, George, and I would gather in the village on snowy days, look for snowmen that other people had made, and have fun destroying them as we found them. But one day, we discovered a strange snowman. The snowman was as big as an adult, wearing a black cloak and had deeply carved eyes and mouth. Paul put his hand inside the snowman's mouth and screamed, pulling his hand out quickly. His hand was bleeding. It turned out that there were many blades inside the snowman's mouth. In rage, Paul shouted, Whoever dared make me bleed shall bleed too. He started to remove the snowman's cloak. Then, Paul walked back and ran toward the snowman, smashing it with a flying kick. <laughs> we cheered in delight. But something came out of the broken snowman's body. It looked like some sort of heart. We screamed and ran away. Later, the police investigated and found out that it was a goat's heart. However, they couldn't figure out who had put it there. That night before bed, I felt an inexplicable sense of fear. It was as if incredibly cold air was entering my room. Even tightly wrapped in a blanket, my body shivered and I couldn't sleep all night. Since that day, I have been tormented by the feeling that the cold air has followed me all day long. Winter break ended and I went to school and received some shocking news. Paul had died. It turned out that one day, Paul had jumped and tried to deliver a flying kick to another snowman, but slipped and fell backward, breaking his neck and dying. George and I were at a loss for words. We didn't say it, but we both felt a sense of shared terror. Since then, a sinister atmosphere loomed over the village, and all parents sternly warned their children never to smash snowmen. However, after some time, another heavy snowfall occurred, and as usual, a snowman wearing a black cloak was built in the middle of the village the next day. Some foolish children smashed the snowman, and shortly after, a boy in the neighborhood choked to death on a candy. He was one of the children who had smashed the snowman. After that, the parents in the village never allowed their children to go outside on snowy days and locked their doors tightly. Thus, no one walked around the streets on snowy days. Nevertheless, the day after heavy snowfall, the snowman with the black cloak would always appear in the middle of the street, but no one dared to touch it. As time went by, the snowman no longer appeared in the village, and fortunately, no more tragedies occurred. However, since then, 
mentioning the snowman in the village has been strictly forbidden. To this day, it remains unsolved who made that snowman and what it was. It's still an unresolved mystery. My name is Kylie and this happened when I was 16 years old. I had two bullies named Alger and AJ. I wanted to tell my mom about my two bullies, but she'd probably hit me with a slipper if I did. I hated walking to school, not because I'm tired of walking, but because AJ and Alger would bully me on the side of the bridge. They'd take my money and threaten me that if I told anyone, they'd hurt me. One day, as usual, they took my money and threatened me, but before they went, I yelled at their back. Screw this, I'm telling the teachers about this, I said. AJ then kicked me and I passed out. When I woke up, it was already nighttime. I was laying on the floor the whole day and AJ and Alger were nowhere to be seen. I just went home and didn't bother to tell my mom what happened. The next day I wake up and feel happy that it's the weekend and I don't have to deal with AJ and Alger. Someone then knocked on the door. When I opened it, it was AJ and Alger. They smelled so bad. AJ just told me to come with them and they'll treat me, but said it in a cold voice. I was so hungry, so I went with them. I thought we were going to a restaurant, but we just went to the bridge. Both of them were standing in front of me and staring at me wildly. Honestly, I was more scared of the smell of them because they smelled like corpses. I wanted to vomit so bad, so I went to the side of the bridge, and then I saw it. AJ and Alger's corpses were down the bridge with their necks snapped because of the fall. That's when all the memories from yesterday flashed back. The reason why AJ kicked me yesterday is because I pushed both of them. Her feet hit me. That's why I fell down and my head hit a rock and I passed out. All of that happened yesterday. I looked back at AJ and Alger and they're getting closer and closer. Both of them then snapped their neck, their own neck, and just ran right towards me. When they disappeared, the smell was gone, but their bodies down the bridge still have that smell and always will. This isn't a story about me, but rather my friend. His name is Jacob. This is a scary story about a spirit he saw twice in his life. The first time was when he was standing in his parents' room, talking to his very sick dad. At the time, he was dying of stage 4 esophageal cancer. He got the feeling something was behind him. He looked toward the doorway to the living room and something that was about four foot six and fully black with horns and blood red eyes was peeking around the corner with its hands on the door frame. He ran towards it and it slipped back around the door. When he got outside the doorway, there was nothing. His dad was completely confused when he stepped back inside the room and told him about what he saw. People who stayed at his house in his dad's final days claimed to have seen it. His mom saw the figure on multiple occasions, in multiple places, until he passed away. Fast forward four months. His big brother Luke was in a coma. He and his mother were going to the hospital to see him. And when they entered the hospital room, their stomachs turned inside out. They saw the figure, but this time it was taller. It was standing right over Luke, looking at him. When the figure noticed them, it glared at them. Then he blinked, and it was gone. Jacob said he couldn't sleep at all that night. He said he felt like someone was watching him when he was trying to sleep. I have a feeling that thing is the person that died before, since it was taller when it looked at his brother. If it was four foot six then, does that mean that a child died? What did it look like when no one died yet? We are 19 now. His brother hasn't woken up, and he's never seen the spirit since that day. This happened to me December 10th, 1996. I was at my friend's house because we celebrated our birthday that night. Time passed by and eventually we needed to leave and head home. We were on our way home, but before reaching my house, we passed by a cemetery. My male friend, let's call him gay, was driving the motorcycle and he escorted me to my house while I was in the back just enjoying the cold gushes of wind. Now, cemeteries here in the Philippines are quite different because the coffins are placed inside cement and are painted white. 
They are piled up so we can reach up to three to five coffins up in the air. Back to the story. The cemetery was to my left. The moon was shining brightly as if it were day. And as I looked up, the very first thing I saw made my entire body freeze. There stands a tall, big figured man wearing a barong Tagalog, a traditional attire in the Philippines. The most bone chilling part was that it had no face, just white. I asked my friend, hey, are you seeing what I'm seeing? Then he replied, yes, what the hell is that? After seeing the faceless man at the very entrance of the cemetery, there were three ladies walking, two white ladies at the side holding up candles and one black lady in the middle. That made me wonder why they were at the gate when no one was walking towards it. I looked at my watch and my eyes widened as it was 12 a.m. sharp. Gay, you can drive faster, I told my friend as he hastily drives. And as we turn left, I look back to where the faceless man was standing and to my surprise, it was now looking in my direction. I faced front and never looked back again. We arrived at my house. I told my mom what happened and called my other friend who also passed by the cemetery and they said they saw nothing. Goosebumps, just goosebumps. Gay didn't want to take that route home, so instead he took the long way and safely arrived at his house. To this day, I never look at that cemetery whenever we pass by at night. I didn't want to stay up late and see that again. What was that faceless man? Why were those three ladies holding up candles? I don't really know. When I was younger, around nine years old, I used to hold the corn with my cousins, our parents, and our grandparents. We would stay up holing late at night in a barn with only one working light, so the ambient was perfect for telling stories. One night my father told us something that was a true story of a woman he knew. We live in a small village, so everyone knows pretty much everyone around here. There was once an average-looking, middle-aged woman who always carried a walking stick with her. She claimed that she was the bravest person in the whole village and would always make that loud and clear, but people would just ignore her. One time, though, when she was yet again proudly preaching about her courage, a man stepped forward and said, You are always talking about how brave you are, but we cannot be sure, can we? I'll dare you to do something, and if you're as brave as you claim to be, you will accept the challenge. The woman, feeling like the challenge couldn't be that bad, answered, I accept your challenge. I don't need to know what the dare is to accept it. I'm not afraid of anything. The man smiled and replied, All right, I dare you to go to the cemetery tomorrow evening and sit on one of the graves. You have to sit there until the church bell rings at midnight. Then you can come back. If you can't stay till midnight and you return early, the whole village will know that you are a liar. The woman had no other choice but to do as he said. She accepted the challenge. The next day, she was waiting for it to get dark. She didn't have to wait long, though. The winter was almost here, and it got dark sooner. She went to the cemetery and soon found a grave to sit on. It was freshly buried, so the ground was soft. She stuck her walking stick in the ground and sat down nervously waiting for midnight. After a few hours, she heard the bell ring, so that meant she was free to leave the cemetery. She sighed with relief, glad that nothing happened. She only had to walk her way back home. She tried to get up, but felt that something was dragging her skirt into the ground. She didn't want to turn around to see what was behind her. Panicked as she was, she grabbed her stick and tried to pull herself up, but her skirt was pulled into the ground harder this time. Feeling her clothes being dragged deeper and deeper, she screamed, Help me! The dead is dragging me into the grave! Help! But no one could hear her. The woman didn't return home that night. The next morning, a group of people went looking for her. They found her laying on a grave, dead. Her walking stick was stuck into her skirt, making it impossible for her to get up. When she pulled herself up with it, it only went deeper into the fresh earth. She died of a heart attack that she had out of fear. This is a true story 
about what a Japanese monk experienced when he was a college student. He was a student in the Buddhist department of a university in Satima. His father was a monk, but he was the second son and didn't have a temple to inherit. So he enrolled in the Buddhist department and lived in a dorm for Buddhist students. It wasn't an easy lifestyle because he had to keep up with his studies and train to be a monk at the same time. He was very tired of the daily routine of waking up at 5 a.m., getting water sprayed, chanting Buddhist scriptures, going to school, etc. To relieve stress, he would take a walk around the university dorm, but there was no entertainment facilities around the dormitory, and there was nowhere to chill. There was a pet shop about four kilometers away, so he would go there with a friend to relieve stress. One day, he was playing with a big dog and taking pictures. Then suddenly, the owner came out from inside the shop, angrily saying, Who told you to take pictures? And scolded him. You didn't take pictures of people, did you? The monk was taking pictures with a disposable camera at the time, and he was so frightened that he told the owner that he didn't take pictures of people, but he would just give him the camera anyway. The owner replied that it was okay if he didn't need to take pictures of other people. The monk apologized one last time in Kansai dialect, and then was scared and wanted to go home. But suddenly, the owner's attitude changed dramatically. He asked where he was from, and when the monk said he was from Kyoto, he said he was from there too, and seemed to be delighted. He wanted to chat and led him to a small house next to the pet shop and told him stories about himself. He used to run a pachinko parlor, and he was happy to meet someone from his hometown and ask the monk to be his friend. When he realized that the monk was a Buddhist student at the nearby university, he even made him a job offer. Can you help me with my pet shop and walk the dog for 15 minutes twice a week and talk to me in our dialect afterwards? He offered to pay him 150,000 yen, which is about $1,100 for the job, which sounded like an amazing offer. So the monk took the job. However, his friend stopped him because he thought it was weird. So he told the man that he would ask his dorm teacher first and then decide. The man said okay and brought out some canned coffee to let them choose one. The monk picked a can and his friend refused. When he got back to the dorm, he asked the teacher about the job. The teacher got really mad at him because even though he was studying Buddhism, he still had that greed inside him. The monk went back to the pet shop to decline the job offer. The man said he understood and brought out some canned coffee again, making him choose one. The monk chose one, drank it, and returned to the dorm. After that day, the monk was busy and didn't go to the pet shop. Eventually, he had to move to Tokyo, so he went to the pet shop one last time to say goodbye to the man. The man was very sorry to hear the news because it was the last time. He brought out several canned coffees and let him choose one. The monk chose one and drank it on the spot. Then the man suddenly asked, You said you were a monk. Is there a real god or Buddha? The monk replied that he was practicing because he believed so. When he heard the answer, he offered him another can of coffee. The monk refused and left. That was the last time they ever met. Three years later, the monk in Tokyo received a phone call from his dorm teacher telling him that the pet shop owner was a serial killer. The owner of the pet shop was responsible for a series of murders that caused an uproar in Japan at the time, and one of his murder philosophies was to kill those who are greedy. The teacher told him this and said that if he had accepted that part-time job back then, he would have died. The monk was creeped out by the call, and he later learned something else from an article. When the serial killer was interviewed in jail, he told the reporter that he thinks there is a god or Buddha. The reporter asked him why, and he said, I used to own a pet shop in Satima, and I killed a guy. Then a monk came to visit, and I served him coffee with four out of five cans poisoned and one unpoisoned. The monk came back three times, and all three times he chose the non-poisoned one. I even offered him another can at the last time, but he refused. Maybe there really is a god. Maybe he was protected by a god. This is a true story that happened in Japan between Sakin, the perpetrator of the Satima pet shop serial murders, and Mika Duan, a monk. The killer, Sakin, was very famous in Japan, and even a movie called Cold Fish was made in Japan based on his story. Mika Duan still has photos of him playing with the dogs in the pet shop, and he appeared on Japanese television several times to tell the story in person. Sakin told the story when he was interviewed before his death, saying he believed there was a god. 
A few years ago, the following post was posted to an online community. Hi guys, I'm a 23-year-old girl, and this guy has been following me for a few days now. He's got this weird big wooden sword, so I thought he was a martial artist, and I walked past him, but he kept following me. The other day, he followed me on the bus, pointed the sword at me, and kept muttering something to himself. The other day, I was on the subway, and people were looking at me. When I turned around, there he was again, staring at me and muttering. I freaked out and ran away, even though it wasn't my stop. Since then, I've been walking around the neighborhood every day, and my head hurts so much, like it's being squeezed by someone. Yesterday, my best friend called me and she told me that a man approached her on the street and yelled at her in a very angry tone. Your friend is in great danger, please tell me where she is. So my friend walked by thinking it was some weird cult guy. But then she was spooked and called me, and she said the guy was carrying a wooden sword. It was the guy I saw. What was going on? What's even creepier is as I'm writing this, I can see that guy looking at me outside the window, swinging his sword around. I'll post again later. She posted a photo of the silhouette of a man outside her window, which received hundreds of comments. And the next day she posted another. I ended up calling the cops. And when they asked the guy what he was doing, he just stared at me for a while without saying anything. What was weird about his gaze was that he wasn't looking at my face. He was staring at the space above my head for a long time. What the heck is this situation? That was the end of the post, and the comments came flooding in. The story didn't end there, and she posted again a few days later. Hey everyone, it's me. It wasn't over yet. He's standing in front of my front door right now, chanting some spell, and he's shouting like he's swearing. The weird thing is that every time he chants, my whole body hurts. I feel like I'm being torn apart. Why is this happening? I need to talk to him. She posted a photo of herself and her whole body was red. People kept commenting and asking what happened. After a while, she responded to their comments. I answered the front door and yelled at him, what do you want? And he answered that I was possessed by an evil spirit and if I don't get it off of me soon, I'm in trouble. People went crazy in the comments telling her he was lying and she shouldn't be fooled. She commented again. Now this guy is telling me that the first time he saw me on the bus, the evil spirit was eating my hair. Then the next time he saw me on the subway, it swallowed my entire head. Now it's swallowing my whole upper body and if I don't get rid of it fast, I'm going to die. He said he's been casting spells to get rid of it, but it's not going away, so he came to see me in person. Somehow these days I have nosebleeds, my lips turn blue for no reason, and I can't breathe well. What should I do, guys? The post got tons of comments from people concerned about her, but then she stopped posting. Then a week later, a post popped up saying, Hi there. I'm the sister of the girl who wrote that a man came to visit her a while ago. She died a short time ago. The man came to my sister and said she was possessed by an evil spirit, so we had exorcism rituals for a while. However, it turned out that he tortured my sister in madness. He beat her with a wooden sword for five hours. He said that he had to beat her until she bleeds black blood, and only then would the evil spirit be dead. Eventually he went to jail, but he is still arguing that he is innocent and that the evil spirit consumed her. After this post, nothing was posted on the online community about her. Many people were left shocked and horrified for a while as they recalled her incident. Hi, Wansi. I want to share my experience that happened way back in 2012. This is my true horror experience, and ever since that day, I believe in guardian angels. 3 a.m. It was my first time working in Manila, Philippines. I worked at Jollibee Fast Food and my schedule was 2 p.m. to 12 midnight. At that time, we had an overtime charity, so we needed to extend cleaning for two hours. When I got out of the store, it was almost 2.25 a.m. My aunt's house where I'm staying is nearby, so I didn't need a ride. My usual route is on the highway, which is on the left road. While I was walking, someone whispered in my ear. The voice said, don't go there. I looked back and there was no one walking behind me. 
but there were a few people on the sidewalks. I walked back and ended up using the right road. When I got home, I looked at the clock on the wall and it was exactly 3 a.m. I heard a gunshot, but I was so sleepy at the time, I didn't pay much attention to it. I brushed my teeth and then went to sleep. My cousin woke me up. I asked him what time it was and he said, it's 4 a.m. He said someone died on the left highway. It was a security guard at a motorcycle store. He was shot in the head and according to my aunt, they robbed the truck with motorcycle supplies and killed the security guard. And all this happened at 3 a.m. That's when I remembered the whisper I heard. If I had taken that left route, maybe I would also be dead now, if I happened to witness the crime. I'm thankful for my guardian angel, but I'm also sad as well because of what happened to the security guard. Hi, I've been watching all of your scary videos every time you guys upload them. I find all the stories interesting and very terrifying, but I never expected I would experience something horrifying, just like the videos you guys upload. Here's my story. I'm a girl who lives in a province here in the Philippines, and people here are very superstitious, especially the old folks. I never believed in those superstitious beliefs, but I never imagined that those beliefs would one day save my life. It happened two months ago when I got accepted as a tutor for a kid in the barangay near us. The salary was nice, and so was the family. It had been three weeks since I started being a math tutor for their child, and I was on my way to their house when I noticed people staring at me weirdly, as if they saw a ghost or something. I just shrugged it off and made my way to the student's house. I knocked on the door and smiled at the mother, who smiled back at me, but her smile suddenly faded away and she looked at me like how the people on the street did. I thought I messed up my makeup or something, so I asked her, but she stood there quietly. The awkward silence was interrupted when I heard my student's cheerful voice shouting my name and running towards my direction. I was excited to hug her too since she was always hyped up to see me, but she stopped midway and started crying. Her mother snapped back to reality and said, maybe she's just tired, you can have a seat in the living room while I prepare lunch. Even though I was confused, I just sat on their nearby sofa and I heard my students screaming. Why is my teacher's head missing? I was shocked by what the kids said and it became even creepier when her dad approached me, also looking scared and said, I think you should go home for now. But remember, if you arrive home, burn all the clothes that you're wearing today. It didn't make sense but I just nodded and went home. At home, I recalled all those bizarre things that happened and told my parents about it. My parents, who were never superstitious at all, suddenly got up and started praying. They told me to burn the clothes that I wore that day immediately. Since their reaction creeped me out, I did what they all told me to, so I burned my clothes that night. While burning my clothes, I could smell some weird odor that made me want to puke. I told my brother to watch my burning clothes because I was going to get a glass of water. But on my way, I fainted. When I woke up, it was already 7.30 p.m. I asked my mom what happened and they told me I fainted. So they took me to the hospital and they said I was fine. Since I couldn't wake up in the morning, my parents informed my students' parents that I wouldn't be there since I was sick. But the next thing shocked me because while listening to the radio, we heard that there was a shootout that happened in the street during 8.30 in the morning. And luckily, no one got injured since no one was walking on those streets at that time. But that's the same street that I always walk on at exactly 8.30 in the morning to get to my student's house. I then realized that the reason my student saw me headless is that I was about to get into an accident. And if I hadn't burned my clothes, I would have been a victim of the shootout. You see, in the Philippines, if people see you headless, it was advised that you should burn your clothes that you're wearing that day in order to be safe. The story begins in the summer of 2020, when my girlfriend, some friends and I were on a trip to a town near my city for a few days. 
The city has a beautiful port area with some cliffs behind it. These cliffs are very high, and jumping from them, it is impossible. Instead of sand, there were hard rocks and stones. The small town is famous for two things, its tourists and its fishermen. On the first day of our trip, we decided to go for a walk to the cliffs to watch the sunset and bring some beer and snacks. The town's coast is situated in a big gulf that includes our hometown as well, so they're pretty close to one another. There was a large oil tanker that was anchored in the gulf for an extended period of time because of false documentation. Nobody claimed the illegal ship and the crew were off of the ship, so it was just stranded there for over a year. As we watched the sunset, only the large oil tanker and a few fishing boats were in the calm sea. It was a wonderful summer evening. The sun eventually set and we had a few laughs talking about stuff we wanted to do that summer. However, my friend Alexander noticed something odd. Hey, shouldn't that ship be empty, guys? He said. At first I ignored it, thinking it was an automatic light that just happened to be flashing that night. But eventually, the flashing lights became two, and then three, and suddenly a large portion of the ship was clearly illuminated. It seemed strange, but we knew nothing about ships, so we assumed there must have been a mechanic left behind to watch and maintain the ship while someone came to take it home. We went to bed, and all of my friends had already forgotten about it, except for me. I had a nagging feeling that something was wrong. The very next day, we went to a local fast food chain to get some breakfast, and the TV inside was on the local town channel, which gave information about nearly everything. And then we saw it. Three sailors dead after attempting to board an abandoned ship in the Gulf last night. Reports say that two of them had their throats cut and the third one died from electric shock. Did what we saw have anything to do with the sailors' deaths? Or was it just a sad coincidence? Why were the lights shining? Who cut the sailors' throats? And what were they searching for on this ship? I still don't know to this day. The police dismissed the case as an accident a month later. <laughs> this happened when I was about 22 years old. I had been going to horror experiences as a group for a while at the time. It was a lot of fun until this happened. There were five of us in the group, and we traveled to scary places all over the country, exploring places like abandoned houses or haunted places. Along the way, we occasionally saw ghosts, experienced mysterious things, but for the most part, there was nothing to be worried about. Then one day, the leader of the group called to say that he had found something a little more out of the ordinary this time. A man had reached out to him, saying that something horrifying was living in his house and that we should come and see it. He wouldn't tell us what it was, but we were curious and eager to see it. So we decided to visit. That day, we packed our bags and set off for the house. After a five-hour drive, we arrived at the house. It was an ordinary house, and when we entered, we were greeted by a middle-aged man. He was living alone. He began to tell us about the creature that lived in his house. With sparkling eyes, he explained excitedly what a strange creature it was. We were full of curiosity. He told us that one day, while hunting in the forest, he came across the creature that he had never seen before in his life, and the moment he saw it, he knew it wasn't an animal nor human. The creature was wounded and bleeding, and its blood was brown. He captured it and brought it home and tied it up. The creature didn't drink water, it didn't eat bread, vegetables, fruit, or anything else. It would only eat live animals. It would eat and digest the whole thing, including every drop of blood and bone. So the man went out hunting every day and brought back animals to feed the creature. It had an amazing appetite devouring animals every day, and the man said he was exhausted from hunting every day. But his expression seemed excited while saying this. He didn't tell anyone about it because he was afraid that if he called the police, they would take the creature away, and if he spoke to the media, someone would definitely come and steal it. Then he said he was only showing it to us because he thought it would be okay for people like us. His story was hard to believe until we saw it with our own two eyes. After a while, he led us to the basement. When we entered the basement, there was a chained creature we had never seen before. It looked like a man, but it had large, sharp bones sticking from every bone in its body. 
and its skin was made of a hard, plastic-like material. It had large, wide teeth. As soon as it saw us, it started hopping mad, drooling sticky yellow saliva. We were terrified that it would break the chain. The man laughed and said, It's amazing, isn't it? I've never fed it human meat before. It probably won't even be a bite for him. We were all terrified and tried to take pictures, but the man wouldn't let us. So we stood there, completely blown away by the sight. When suddenly, he shoved our backs toward the creature. One of my friends, Lila, actually got close enough to be grabbed by it, but managed to get away. The man let out a short sigh of regret, and we yelled at him, What are you doing? Another friend, Brady, became enraged and punched the man in the face. But the man was an incredibly strong man, and Brady couldn't take him down. He grabbed Brady and threw him at the monster, which bit down on Brady's leg. There was a tremendous crunch and the sound of a bone breaking, with Brady's scream shaking the basement. My friends barely managed to pull Brady to safety, and his leg was badly crushed and torn. I was outraged and managed to tackle the man. I knocked him down and began punching him ferociously in the face, and my friends joined in. The man's face was eventually covered in blood, and we quickly gave first aid to Brady. The creature was screaming a bizarre noise and seemed to be amused. We quickly got out of there and went to the hospital. The doctor looked at Brady's leg and asked what happened, and when we told him about the monster, he didn't believe us. Luckily, Brady was treated and he was fine. But to this day, his leg is covered with some very serious scars. We called the police and the man was punished. But the police seemed to keep the monster's existence a secret. Since then, our meetings are over and we've continued to search for the creature, but have never found out its true identity. <laughs> Recently, I've started having strange dreams. It was a dream about a woman gnawing off other people's faces with her teeth. By the time I got exasperated with the recurring dreams, I realized that it wasn't a dream. When I got my mind right, I realized I was in a dungeon and there were some people around me with their skin peeled off from their faces, looking terrible. All of them were missing eyeballs and were laying on the floor, constantly moaning. Someone had many areas of their body severely dented, such as the upper arms and thighs. I tried to scream at the horrible sight, but my voice did not come out. For some reason, I had no energy at all in my body. I could just roll my eyes. I barely touched my face with trembling hands and checked on my body. Fortunately, my skin was still okay. After a while, I could hear someone's voice in the hallway. How many faces are left? Only a few left for me to eat. Ugh. Hurry up and gather some new pretty girls. Along with the voice, I heard someone getting nearer, and my heart started beating like crazy. Other than me, there were about three more people whose faces were undamaged, and they were all holding their faces, crying. Then, a woman and two giant bodyguards opened the door and came in. The woman came over and looked at each person one by one for a long time. She touched their skin with her hand and smelled them. She stared closely at my face and said with a wide open smile, I should save this one to eat later, but that kind of face expression puts me off my appetite. So you'd rather cry like the others. <laughs> Her voice was creepy like a witch's. She agonized for hours over the four of us and eventually went close to a woman and bit off her face. She screamed furiously, but all that came out was a weak sound of an air leak. The woman exclaimed in wonder, I knew it would be like this. The skin is so chewy. As expected, I'm correct. Take her to the operating room and pluck out her eyes. I was in terrible shock. I couldn't remember why I was here or even when. I couldn't remember anything. And that night, I had a dream again. Some men gave me an injection and left. And after a while, I heard gunshots, people screaming, and loud footsteps echoing through the hallway. And after a while, the police opened the door and came in and shook me. Then I woke up from the dream. 
I was lying in the hospital. A man came up to me and introduced that he is a detective and explained, You were imprisoned in that cellar for two weeks. Do you remember? I said, I don't remember anything. The detective continued talking. (sighs) It's a really horrible case. The madwoman ate off a total of seven people's faces and body parts. You were abducted two weeks ago, and every night you were given anesthesia. Fortunately, a missing persons report was filed, and while tracking you down, we discovered the basement. You are safe now. I couldn't believe anything. Why the hell did that woman do this? Then one thing came to mind. All the people in that prison were pretty. Suddenly, my head hurt as if it would break, and the forgotten memories came to mind. The model recruitment ad I saw two weeks ago. When I saw the ad for a very high-paid job, I remembered going to an interview, and I don't remember anything since then. After a while, the last memory came to mind. When I arrived there, I met the woman, and what she said as she looked at me. Oh my, take good care of her. Everything is to my taste, from head to toe. I will eat everything, except the bones. I woke up in the middle of the night with my cousin sleeping next to me. This happened about two or three years ago, when we were at our grandparents' house, but they weren't home since they had been invited to a party. It was just the two of us, and we were old enough to stay alone. I got up to get a cup of water, and as I walked back to my bed, I heard scratching at the window next to where my cousin and I were sleeping. I was too afraid to remove the curtain, so I just laid back down. But then, I heard the scratching again, and I was on the verge of tears. Being a teenager, my mind was running wild, and I couldn't help but imagine seeing two glowing eyes in the dark. I have had night terrors before, which made my fear of the dark even worse. I woke up my cousin, who was initially frustrated with me, but then he agreed to check the window. He put his hand on the curtain, pulled it back, and suddenly, there was a high-pitched scream. I started crying uncontrollably, but my cousin covered my mouth and jumped onto the bed, warning me that it was a skinwalker and that it might hurt us. The creature screamed again, and I was crying so hard, but silently. My cousin told me that when he pulled the curtain back, he saw it running on the walls like a deformed wolf, and then it jumped onto the balcony and hopped off, screaming all along. I was in such terror that I couldn't believe what I was experiencing. We lived in the city. This was unheard of. After the screams of the creature, I passed out. When I woke up, my cousin told me that nothing else had happened. We immediately ran outside in the fresh morning sunlight and checked the windows. There were long and jagged scratch marks on the windows and walls, and we could see paw and human prints on the walls. I went to check on the pet goldfish that my dad had left outside in a bowl of water, and to my surprise, they were all gone. Only a puddle of water remained on the ground. We didn't tell our grandparents because we were afraid of something bad happening to us. You might not want to believe me, but I know what happened that night. The claw marks, high-pitched screams, footprints, and everything my cousin saw will stick with us forever. My name is Zach, and I have a girlfriend named Mira. One day, Mira and I were walking towards school when we saw Jason Vasco. I asked them what they were doing, and they said Vasco was going to the school alone later because there is an old story from our school about a woman in the very back corner of an empty hallway who is constantly looking for her child at midnight. If she sees you, she's going to ask you if you've seen her child. Upon hearing the news, I wanted to get my girlfriend's attention. This was creepy. Jace also said that you have to write a signature. It's part of the ritual, and the plan is to get to the school around midnight. I said, what? Vasco can't do that. Look at him shaking over there. I chuckled, and then Jace replied, then you should go. I got goosebumps and replied, yeah, yeah, okay, I guess I can. A few hours passed and it was midnight. I brought a doll just in case the story turned out to be true and headed for the school. I could see Jace and Vasco from far away, keeping their distance. So we had a little chit chat and then I went inside the school. I walked and walked and then someone or something appeared in front of me. There was a woman who had a hat, short hair, and was smiling creepily at me. She said, you are holding my baby. You are holding my baby. You are holding my baby. 
And I said, yeah, yes, she's your baby. And then I took off down some hallway, but found myself trapped in a dead end. The rain was pouring down and it echoed off the roof. Lightning reflected in the window, which got my attention. And I could see there is a picture of the same woman looking back at me. I wrote down my signature as fast as I could and got back outside. We decided to go home and my girlfriend Mira, Jace and Vasco were all shocked when I told them what happened. I wrote my signature on the window and not in the picture. Jace nervously asked me if I was joking and I said I wasn't. Does that mean? This is a true story about my mother. Naturally, most people believe that their parents are unique or special, and I'm no different. However, when I was around 16, I discovered that my mom was special in a very different way. My mom has the ability to predict death. I know that to most people, something like this sounds impossible or made up from a movie, but there's no logical explanation for what she's seen. When she was in her early 20s, she had a dream of a closed coffin and a voice telling her, You know who it is. A week later, my grandmother dropped dead from a heart attack. As creepy as this prediction is, there's one that still gives me shivers down my spine. One day, a friend introduced her to a cousin of theirs who had just given birth to a newborn baby. The night after they all had dinner together, my mother had a dream. In the dream, she saw a baby lying on its back, smiling and giggling. Suddenly, a large hand began to slowly wrap its fingers around the infant's neck. My mother awoke in a panic, unable to get her dream off her mind. To her horror, she received a terrible phone call. The newborn baby she had met only days before had died. The dream she had the night before wasn't just a random nightmare or her brain playing tricks on her. It was yet another premonition, the second one she had since my grandmother. Though this story happened years ago, my mother's spine-chilling ability still hasn't stopped. Just days ago, a member of our church passed away due to a brain aneurysm. When my mother heard the news, she told me that weeks before it happened, she kept hearing a voice in her head that wouldn't go away. It whispered, Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I'm a truck driver. This is a story of what happened during the rainy season when it rained endlessly. It rained continuously for weeks and I went to work grumbling about it. When I was getting on the truck at dawn, I noticed my coworker walking with someone in the rain, putting arms around each other's shoulders. I shouted at him, Hey, are you two going on a date in the rain? But he ignored me and kept walking. I felt a bit offended, but I didn't think it was a big deal and ignored it. A few days later, while I was driving my truck again on a rainy day at dawn, the boss called me and told me that a colleague had suddenly disappeared. His truck was parked all by itself on the road with the door open. The boss got angry at me and shouted, What the hell is going on these days? A few days later, when the rain stopped, we heard news that two truck drivers from our company were missing. Their trucks were still parked where they have been, with the door open, without even a trace. I tried to contact their family, but they said they have been out of contact as well. I reported it to the police, but there was no progress. After a while, it rained again. Early that morning, I was getting on the truck when I saw a man standing in front of me. He seemed to be the one who put his arm around my coworker's shoulder. He was slowly walking towards me in the rain without an umbrella. I shouted at him, Michael is missing. Do you know where he is? Then all of a sudden, he walked towards me and shouted, Nice to meet you. He raised his hand as if to put his arm around my shoulder. I noticed that he had something in his hand, a very long needle. I was so surprised that I kicked him and jumped right back on the truck. As I frantically sped up, I felt a sting on my neck. When I looked at it, blood was flowing as if it had been pricked by a needle. I called the police and soon they found him hiding under a truck parked in front of our company and arrested him. During the interrogation, he confessed that he was the culprit of the missing truck drivers. 
When the police asked where they are, he said they are in his basement. The police asked him why he abducted them and he replied, Well, when it rains, I get a little weird. I usually could endure it, but when it rains this long, I can't stand it. It was when I was 10. It was also a rainy day like this. I was on the car with my dad. There was a big truck in front of us, full of steel rebar. Then suddenly, one of the rebars fell off, and it went through our car and through my dad's body. I saw it with my own eyes. After that, on rainy days, that scene comes to mind. When I hear the rain, I look for a truck. And he hollered, slamming the desk. Let's go to the basement of my house. I'll show you where it is at. And he screamed like crazy. When the police arrived at the basement of his house, there was a very large steel rebar on the wall, which was embedded in many dead bodies. I work at a small grocery store. The owner of the store was a man named Randy, and one day, he told me a strange story. 20 years ago, Randy worked at a grocery store in the same neighborhood. Back then, there was a co-worker named Curtis, and the two became friends as they worked together. One day, Curtis confessed that he had murdered someone before, and when Randy scoffed at him, thinking it was a joke, Curtis said it is true, and he doesn't get arrested by the police, even if he kills people. So when Randy told him to stop joking, Curtis said he would prove it. One day, while the two were looking for a target, they found a man walking alone in the alley, and Curtis abducted and murdered him. Randy said this is all he knows. He said he has no idea what Curtis did to the man. After a while, a man in the neighborhood was reported missing. The police broke in and interrogated Curtis, but there was no evidence against him. So Randy kept asking Curtis how he did that, but he didn't tell him anything. After all, time passed by and Randy felt a sense of guilt. However, he didn't have the courage to report the incident because if he does, he would make himself an accomplice. Randy told me it has already been 20 years warning me to always watch out for people. It is hard for me to believe what he said. I just thought he made up the story. Then one day, a man named Curtis dropped by our store. Randy greeted Curtis and introduced him to me. I felt a sense of uneasiness. He is that murderer? He was an average looking man. He was rather kind looking. Curtis greeted me with a relaxed face. After a while, while Randy was away, I asked Curtis, Hey, there is something that Randy told me. Is it true? Curtis suddenly stiffened and asked what I'm talking about. I hesitantly said, 20 years ago. Then Curtis cut me off saying, Oh, of course that's a made up story. Does that make sense? Then he got up from his seat with a grave face. After a while, on his way out of the store, he said, Would you like some candy? Then he handed me a piece of candy wrapped in a transparent paper. I took it, but I didn't eat it. He kept looking at me, as if demanding me to hurry up and eat it. As I refused to eat, he asked for it and took it back. From that day on, Curtis kept coming to the store, approaching me every time. He kept asking me to go for a walk or go out to eat, but I constantly refused him. Then Randy came to me one day and said, Looks like you've become a target of Curtis. Run away. Don't ever come back here again. Go far away to another neighborhood. Don't let him find you. I actually quit working after a few days. Fortunately, I no longer had to run into Curtis, but endless fear and doubt lingered in my mind. But after a while, I heard news that Randy was missing. The police found that Randy had last left the store with Curtis and started investigating Curtis. And finally, they found Randy's hair in Curtis's house. However, no matter how hard they searched Randy's body, they just couldn't find it. After persistent investigation, the police finally found something in Curtis's house. There had been a hidden space in the ceiling of his house. In the ceiling, there laid Randy's body. Also, there was a concrete wall. When the wall was drilled, white bones and corpses were found. The DNA test of the bone revealed that it was the man who was missing 20 years ago. Curtis was sentenced to life imprisonment.